Hi, uh, this is Dr. Vahid Aryadust, and in a series of videos, I'm going to discuss reliability. Um, so, as an introduction, I would like to uh, stress that that there will be two types of reliability uh, that I will uh, cover in these videos. One of them is external reliability, and the other one is internal reliability. And then I will show how to conduct uh, a reliability analysis uh, to ascertain external and internal reliability. Um, so I, I'd like to start off by uh, providing an introduction to reliability. Um, first of all, uh, reliability is the extent to which uh, results are consistent or stable across time or groups. That, that's basically what, what we mean by external reliability, but with internal reliability we mean uh, internal consistency, and I will unpack this further later. Um, so reliability is, is very important uh, because it's a prerequisite uh, of instrument design and data coding practice and and especially uh, in language assessment it's uh, one of the important features of uh, a good and precise kind of instrument. Uh, therefore it's necessary but it's not sufficient it's a necessary precondition for validity. In some of the latest uh, uh, models or frameworks for validation, reliability has been included as one of the inferences that we can draw or we must be able to draw uh, from the data that we collect. Uh, well, like I said, there are two types of uh, uh, reliability and uh, I would like to reiterate the, the definition here. Uh, external uh, reliability has to do with comparability between different uses of an instrument. For example, you uh, administer an instrument on two occasions, time one and time two, and you expect that the results uh, will be more or less the same because the, the sample uh, is the same and the sample has not changed. For example, it's not they have not learned anything after the first uh, testing. Uh, in addition, you can also think about uh, the scenario where you have multiple writers uh, who would interpret some writing rubrics. And if they do uh, interpret them differently, then I think uh, the, the, the results that uh, you will see uh, will be quite different. On the other hand, internal reliability has to do with the consistency of results obtained from a collection of items or tasks within a single instrument. Uh, s instruments like tests, really, like questionnaires, uh, like for example a motiva motivation questionnaire. I will, like I said, I will unpack these concepts further. So let's get started with the concept of external reliability. Uh, so in the first video I'm going to discuss reliability across uh, instrument forms uh, and occasions or parallel forms and occasions or times. Then I will discuss uh, inter-rater reliability and inter-rater agreements. Uh, th this is a very interesting book. I highly recommend it by uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Thomas Eckes, uh, An Introduction to Many Facet Rush Measurement. If you would like to take another approach to re reliability. In another video, of course, I will discuss uh, many facets rush measurement and I will show you how to run a uh, useful and helpful uh, many facet analysis because uh, that's something that uh, a lot of test developers and and um, scholars and um, you know graduate students uh, kind of need in their uh, research and in, in their data analysis. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, the first type of external reliability, and that's uh, reliability across instruments. Suppose that you have one reading test, or a, um, let's say, a listening test, or any test that you might think of, uh, and you develop different forms because uh, you, for f on different occasions, you want to use one form or another form. You, you anyway, you have different forms and. Uh, you call them parallel. If they are actually parallel in nature, and if once I mean, if they are parallel in nature, if you administer them to one group of test takers, then the results that you obtain from the administration of two forms to one group of test takers should correlate quite highly. In other words, there should not be a, a, a significant deviation from para from test one to test two 
provided that the uh, group of test takers do not change over time. And in order to create a good parallel test form, it's important to provide details, detailed test specifications. And so, uh, actually, this is um, uh, all, um, a, um, a kind of different concept, and I'm not going to discuss how to develop a very good test specification in this video, but I will um, in, in a video in the future, uh, kind of soon. So you need to provide a good specification of items and tasks, so that if anybody uses those test specifications, uh, they will come up with more or less similar uh, test forms. Um, so how do we estimate the reliability across instrument forms? Well, basically, we just uh, um, calculate a correlation coefficient. For example, if you have interval data for uh, collected through your instrument or through your uh, test, you use the Pearson product moment correlation. I have discussed how to do a Pearson product uh, moment correlation. Uh, uh, but I have not in, in another video, but I have not discussed the Spearman rank order correlation, which is uh, uh, actually suitable for uh, ordinal data, um, which uh, I think I should uh, cover in a separate video. So it's basically it comes down to uh, a correlation analysis between the scores that students achieved on the two parallel forms. Uh, and that's what we call uh, basically reliability across test test forms or instrument forms. Now there is another type of reliability which is estimated in, in exactly the same way but it's called reliability across occasions. Uh, that's you use one form, that's the identical form, uh, exactly just one form of an instrument but you give it to the same group of population or participants uh, across two occasions or across two times. And therefore, if your your instrument is reliable, uh, you expect to get the same scores uh, for the same group of students across the two occasions. Uh, for example, if, if you're administering a uh, test of IQ or IQ test, uh, if someone's score is 140 uh, in time one, then suddenly it drops to, let's say, 95 in time two, there is little or just no reliability in the scores that that uh, you have obtained. Now, I would like to show how you can estimate this reliability. This is an SPSS file. Uh, let me just drag it from the side so it would, would fit the uh, window better. Okay, so I have two variables here. It's actually fictitious data from time one and time two. Uh, this, this test it's the same test which has been administered across two times. So I just go to analyze and go to correlations and by varied correlations I've already chosen the, the two. I'm going to reset it actually. So time one and time two I move it to this side. I don't want to really choose anything else at this time because my intent is just to get a correlation between time one and two and click OK. Uh, here are the results. The correlation between the two tests is 0 0.603 and if you want to estimate its um, effect size it's going to be 0 0.603 uh, times 2 Yeah, that's uh, uh, square actually. Uh, so the effect size is 0 0.36 almost 0 0.36 which means that about uh, uh, 33, uh, sorry, 36% of the variance is common between time one and time two. It's the same test, so it provides some evidence of reliability. But I wouldn't say that this is this is a very strong kind of evidence for reliability. Um, it's about medium, perhaps. Um, in in the second video, I will also talk about the ranges of reliability and how we. Uh, actually uh, decide and uh, decide whether a reliability index is high or, or low. Uh, what happens between time one and time two assessments could be learning or could be a student's familiarity. So one reason why this correlation is not perfect might be one of these extraneous variables, familiarity and learning. So if you're interested to find out why the, the, why this has not uh, been a perfect uh, correlation, um, you probably want to 
uh, dig further to find out whether uh, any learning has happened between time 1 and time 2. If that has happened, that's one of the reasons why the reliability has dropped down. Well, another uh, kind of reliability is reliability within and across raters and as well as a rater agreement which is a kind of different concept and I'm going to visualize these for you so you will get the idea uh, but but I would like to start by talking about uh, within raters so within is is also known as uh, intra rater reliability uh, here intra rater reliability and that's when the uh, scores or the ratings that one rater assigns to to a group of students, for example, in a reading, t uh, in a speaking test, or in a writing test, uh, uh, on two different occasions, have a high correlations. So you get your raters to score a group of students' performance, for example, essays, in time one. Then you get them to score the same group of students in time two once again then you would expect that there would be a high correlation between the two occasions and that means uh, evidence that provides evidence uh, for inter-rater reliability of the rater now inter-rater reliability is also a similar concept but the difference is that you you get two or more raters to perform on one set of let's say papers or or student performances on some items on some um, let's say writing or speaking tasks so here I would like to visualize it for you to to, uh, to let you know what I mean imagine that we have got six papers a b c all the way to a b c d e f and e n, in a, e n f so uh, a rater one assigns these scores using a rubric whatever that rubric is is a fictitious scenario and rater two also assigns uh, these these scores. So let's say um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change these into four and three and zero. Okay. So now you see that there is no agreement between the two raters because rater one thinks that uh, uh, the paper A deserves a five, whereas rater two gives it a four. So there is no agreement here and no agreement here either because it's a 4 versus 3 and all the way down you see no agreement at all however this lack of agreement between the two raters does not mean that they don't have these two uh, pairs of scores do not have any correlations so I'm gonna go to insert I'm gonna uh, get a scatter plot here and just uh, click on this scatter and I'll get a scatter plot and you see they fall beautifully on a on a very uh, um, you know on one direct line so I can draw the trend line as well just to show you how it looks like you see it's completely linear and I think the correlation here is 100 percent I'm gonna double click on this to activate uh, the format trend line in to add more statistics here I'm gonna get a uh, R-squared value because the R-squared value indicates uh, the effect size if you remember in another video I discussed this so I'm gonna click on this I get a, an R-squared value let me just uh, this is pretty small so I'm gonna uh, maximize the size yes R-squared value of 1 means perfect correlation and that means they have 100 percent of variance in common um, so I'm going to click on the line again. I like to get the equation as well. Before getting the equation, I think you you can already uh, guess the what the equation will be. The amount of R1, uh, or let, let, let's put it the other way around, because uh, later Excel would put it the other way around. So to be consistent with Excel, uh, I would say the amount of R2 scores equal the R2 itself plus 1. Or the other way around would be, uh, the um, the amount of R2 score equals R1 minus 1 so for this one we got for the first uh, rating we got 5 minus 1 which makes 4 and for the second rating uh, we'll get 4 minus 1 which which makes 3 and so on and so forth so I'm gonna click display equation on, on chart and I'll get that equation which is y equals x minus 1 where whenever if you put y into the equation um, 
if you put x into the equation you can get the amount of y very easily now something very interesting happens I want to show you that agreement is not necessarily uh, a, a consistent concept with a correlation sometimes sometimes you have a good agreement but correlation is not perfect and the other way around sometimes you have no agreement whatsoever but you have a perfect correlation like this extreme scenario now, I'm going to change uh, 4 to 5 so you'll get one agreement here and look at look at the uh, r square value now you see it changes to 0 0.96 actually drops so this is gonna be a yes this time around and as I continue doing this for example if I change 4 to a th uh, sorry 3 to a 4 uh, you see it drops down more it's, it drops to 0, 0 0.95 uh, and in the same way correlation also drops so this is gonna be a yes in this case I have 2 over 6 let me just calculate this really 2 divided by 6 agreement cases that's 0 0.333 almost let's say let's just round it up to 0 0.34 so I have 0 0.34 and the correlation has dropped now I can add add one more uh, agreement here just arbitrarily choose 0 and convert it to, uh, replace it with 1 and yeah you see uh, this supplanting of 0 with 1 uh, results in a drop in the chi square uh, in the r square value as well as the correlation I haven't gotten the correlation in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, figure but it's easy to estimate actually so uh, in conclusion what I'm trying to say is that Raider agreement is not exactly the same as a correlation so wh whenever you have a high correlation you don't mean that there's a good agreement between the two Raiders uh, of course if you read papers in in language assessment and, and applied linguistics you see that some authors uh, simply uh, rely on the inter-Raider reliability or inter-Raider reliability uh, so if if you read such papers you should always uh, make uh, remember that that doesn't mean that the raters really agreed upon the scores rather they agreed upon the ranking of the scores not the not the specific scores themselves now if we have a scenario like this for example if you have got five and and a four it's still possible to for example estimate the average of the mean score of the two and give it a four four point uh, five score but if uh, they deviate more from each other for example like number f number three and you see the, the correlation drops down and there is no agreement still no agreement uh, in this scenario I think we need to get a third opinion from another perhaps a more experienced writer right in order to improve the consistency and raiders scoring we need to provide them with a clear scoring rubric and we need we need them to go through training and norming I have discussed some of this in uh, um, uh, in a different video which focuses on rely uh, sorry on writing assessment and I will further discuss it in the video about the many facets rush measurement as well and uh, so like I said we can calculate the inter-rate reliability in the form of a correlation coefficient and that brings me to the end of the first part of this video in the second part I'm going to discuss internal consistency and Cronbach's alpha uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention if you like the video please give it a like and subscribe to the channel have a good day